sexual and reproductive health is important for women's general health and well-being. It's central to our ability to make choices and decisions about our lives, including when or whether to consider having children. While obstetrician and gynecologist Dr. Loretta Oduware Ogboroko, yes, is here to correct certain anomalies as it relates with women. Welcome to the morning show, Doctor. Thank you very much for joining us. Good First morning. and foremost, thanks, OG. First and foremost, before we even go into uh, your expertise there, the fact that you're an obstetrician, a gynecologist, tell us why that is important and how that is just different from uh, being a woman's doctor. There is more to it than just being a lady doctor. Tell us what being an obstetrician and a gynecologist is. Um, good morning, and it's good to, to be here on the rise. Um, being an obstetrician and gynecologist simply means that you take care of women, pregnant and non-pregnant women. Um, it's an aspect or a sub-specialty area in medicine. And even in that, you also have more sub-spec areas. Um, you have... Um, you can be a gynae oncologist, i.e. you just treat cancers in women, or you can just be strictly obstetrics, where you just treat only pregnant women, or a urogynecologist, where you treat the water works or urinary works problem in women. So it's really, really good to be empowered to cater for the health and well-being of women, um, and sometimes their partners and the babies. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to do. All right. You know, so I, I, I'm glad you said that. Obviously, so beautiful. The female reproductive system, as we know, is designed to carry out several functions from producing female egg cells to fertilization. However, not many women experience full reproduction, um, you know, some factors could be, you know, endometriosis, which is one of our main topics today. I'd like for you to share with us, you know, what this disease is and some of its common symptoms. Endometriosis is a condition where you have the lining of the womb. It's supposed to be inside of the womb, but then you have it in other places apart from the inside of the womb. The womb is shaped like a little cup that is upside down. So within that cup, you have a particular special lining that responds to brain stimulation and hormone stimulation. Every month, if there is no pregnancy, that lining of the womb sheds as menstruation. Now, imagine that that lining of the womb is somewhere else. So that means that every month you are going to have a shedding and a bleeding into those tiny spaces. And those spaces could be in the ovary, which is adjacent to the womb, in the fallopian tubes, in the pelvis. In some cases, it may even be on the bowels. By bowels, I mean the intestine. So every month during a period, there is intense pain, severe pain that would disrupt the quality of life of a woman. And it can go on for many years if undetected, which in most cases is what happens. So it's not something that one should trivialize because most times when women come and say, I have severe pain just before my period, it worsens during my period, and then it seems to ease out after my period. People say, get on with it. I mean, in our social cultural context, most mothers will probably just say, oh, get on with it, it's the period. No, there is a problem. So that, in summary, is what we call endometriosis. It could be extra pelvic sites. It could be very far away. There are people who we found it in their palm in some studies. So it's not just limited to just the pelvic area. There are extreme cases where it can be outside the pelvis. Mm. I mean, in, in addition to being able to understand what it is, can you first, I, I guess I don't, I don't, I don't want to jump the gun here, but, you know, in the research I've been doing into endometriosis, it seems as though while there isn't a cure per se, uh, surgeries definitely can be successful. But in the treatment of it, women are encouraged to either 
um, have a hysterectomy or get pregnant. I mean, it, it does seem quite uh, to be extreme um, choices a woman would have. Can you shed some light on how somebody could treat it or get rid of it? Managing endometriosis varies from woman to woman. I always emphasize, and it's it's the um, guidelines emphasized by those who are really specialized to treat this, i.e. the gynecologists, that you individualize a woman to treat her holistically. So what works for A may not work for B. It may de depend on different times in their lives. First of all, you need to make a diagnosis. You need to know what is happening. And to do that, you must take a proper history. Sometimes we give the women a menstrual diary to chat along with their pain severity. And when they bring it back to you, you just see that at particular times in the month, that is when the pain comes and that ties in with their menstruation. You can then ask for an ultrasound scan, having done a physical examination. And then you do certain trials. It depends. If, if it's not disrupting the quality of life, you could hang on. But for them to come and seek help, it means something is happening. So how do you manage? You can start with simple measures. You could do something like the simple combined oral contraceptive pills. Um, because what happens is anything that sort of tells the brain and the body not to have a menstruation, if you figure it, that's what, it, it would stop that pain. So if you have something like the oral contraceptive pills, it can actually regulate that for some women. You go on to what we call the Mirena. The Mirena IUS is actually what the average woman here would call a coil. It is impregnated with the hormone of pregnancy locally. So when you insert that from down below into the womb, it means that it tells the womb to mimic a state of pregnancy. So after a few months, having fitted it, there is no periods. And that can relieve the pain in certain women. You can go on to use the big guns in medicine. We call them the gonadotrophin um, releasing hormone analogs, GNRH, which tells the brain to create an artificial menopause. And that can help some women. But the danger with that is that you can't keep using that. That's a temporary measure. And it may cause things like bone thinning and all of that. Then you go to the gold standard, which is to do a laparoscopy, a keyhole surgery. Go in, have a look. When you see these endometriotic collections, you actually burn them. We call it diatomy. Burn may sound very big, but use some heat to burn them or cut them out and send them for histology. The radical cases is when you do a hysterectomy. Now, that needs to depend on what stage at life or in life the woman is at. You won't be doing a hysterectomy for a 20-year-old. You will have to, and this is what I'm saying, you have to individualize management, almost like bespoke, fashioning your management for that particular patient. So if a woman is say maybe 45 years old, has completed her family size, and she has crippling endometriosis, and in which case sometimes it's in the muscle of the womb, you may opt for a hysterectomy. Do you get me? But if it's a 20-year-old lady who is yet to attain her full fertility potential, and wishes to get pregnant tomorrow, then you may go for more conservative measures. I think the best and most important thing is to first of all, understand and accept these patients that they've got a problem because they stay in the community, they stay in, in go from doctor to doctor for an average of five years. When I was researching for this program, one of the recent studies I found was as far back as 2015. Dr. Loretta, again, I'd like to ask you to hold your thought there. We're going on a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue on the morning show. Welcome back to the morning show. Our guest, Dr. Loretta, obstetrician and gynecologist author of the book, My Father's Daughter, is still in the studio with us. 
Now, thank you, Dr. Loretta, for taking us through all those treatment uh, process for endometriosis. Now, how available and affordable are these treatment options in Nigeria? Uh, the implications for the average Nigerian woman, first of all, is to know where these treatments are. Um, because sometimes knowing exactly where to assess proper treatment is even more important. Mm. It may not be that costly depending on how severe their condition is. Um, like I said, it may be the basic oral contraceptive pills that may just solve the problem. But in a situation where you go to one of the private hospitals where the MD is probably an eye doctor or a bone doctor, and you've not actually seen someone in that area, you don't get the right treatment, no matter how cheap it is. That's the baseline. So first of all, we must go to the right place. And the treatment can be as cheap as counseling and understanding of the situation. Because sometimes when you know that this pain is not in your head, when you know that having pain during sexual intercourse is not in your head, then you are better acclimatized to cope with that pain and not just people telling you go along with it. In terms of laparoscopic intervention, um, obviously they are a bit more expensive um, for the average Nigerian woman. And so I think on an average, I was, I was told that you could get some for 150,000 to 200,000 Naira. But that depends on the hospital you go to. Generally, the government hospitals are cheaper. Fantastic, thank you. Well, Doctor Doctor Loretta, I know that you we've been we've been maxing out on your your your, your encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes yeah. to women's health and definitely telling us about endometriosis. But in addition to that, you are also a, a, a talented writer. We've got a copy of your book here, My Father's Daughter, and it is well. I don't want. Let me not take the words out of your mouth. If you could tell us more about this story, and I, what's interesting to me is that often people. Talk talk about, you know, the relationships between fathers and daughters and how it's very, very important, how it's fitting for the woman or the young girl, how she will now continue on in her womanhood and adulthood. So when you hear people say that little girls will grow up to marry their fathers, obviously not literally, uh, but marry men who emulate their fathers, it could be definitely be a, a good thing or a negative thing. It seems as though from looking through this book and hearing your story, it does think it does believe that your relationship with your father was definitely a positive one. Please do tell us about that. Um, the book, my father's daughter was born out of, uh, my own experience growing up, um, I, I was fortunate to have not just a dad, but someone who understood the meaning of fatherhood. So it wasn't just my biological father, per se, but someone who was a mentor, a friend, and one who raised me to have so much confidence that anywhere in the world I can hold my own. And I actually thought that was how everybody was being raised. I would um, just take it for granted until I finished boarding house and went to other friends' houses. And then I found out that when their fathers were coming back home, they ran in the opposite direction. And I'm like, no, you should be running towards your dad because my dad would come home with some snacks, then things from Kingsway. It could be ground nuts to donuts, anything at all. And we always found ourselves gravitating towards him. Um, but it wasn't the case. And I found that many children were being raised not to express themselves. They couldn't interrogate processes. You go to other people's house, you ask a question, and they say, oh, keep quiet, you're a child. That wasn't how I was raised. I was raised to interrogate things my father did them. For instance, my dad was the head of malaria control unit in the South South Zone. And I remember one of my first questions to him as a child. I said, Daddy, if you say mosquitoes transmit malaria, hmm, where did the very first mosquito with malaria come from? And he smiled and laughed and said, if I knew that answer, I would be paid a million dollars. So I think in hindsight, I decided that if I was this opportune, I should put this in a book and get this out to people 
out there so that they know how to raise not just the girl child, but most especially the girl child, but also any child, a male child, so that people know how to mentor their friends, bosses know how to mentor people at work and get the best out of people. And by extension, we have a healthier society. So that's what's giving rise to the book, My Father's Daughter. Yeah, it does appear that your father definitely is your role model. Now, I'd love your comment on the argument of feminism and equality of women in the society. It seems like you have definitely conquered that with your confidence um, through your father's role in life. You see, um, I, I would call it equality. I would say equity and I would say gender sensitivity. Um, equality would be misleading. Uh, what we want is fairness. And we are not saying give us things on, on platters of gold. No, we are saying give us these things because we are intelligent, because we merit it. Don't ask me whose daughter I am, whose sister I am, or whose wife I am. Give me that thing because I am Loretta Oduare Okoro Oka, and I have earned it. I have got a brain between my ears. And that's what matters. Every woman should be taking on the merit and strength of what they possess. It doesn't necessarily have to be academic achievements. No, it has to be an empowerment of the mind. You must, and that's what my dad told me. And it's in that book. He said, Loretta, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you can have anything you set your heart on. I mean, there's a part of that book, if you look at it, a, a fancy car drove past myself and my dad one day, and I turned to look at that car. And my dad said, why do you want to break your neck looking at another man's car? You saw it coming towards you. You've appreciated the beauty. Why do you want to um, break your neck looking? I said, that is because I like the car. It was really beautiful. And he said, if you've appreciated the car coming towards you, then Fix your mind on how to work and get the car. Breaking your neck, looking at that car, is now beginning to signify greed. And I think I kept those words in me. You know, there were, there were times, other incidents, somebody opened their purse, and I looked into it, and my dad said, no, you don't do that. So these are, these are things we need to imbibe in our young ones, especially the, the girl child. Because they need to understand that they are all unique. No, not two persons, two of you now are all unique. You've got your gifts and you are empowered with those gifts. Discover them and be who you are. Do not paint another person's canvas and don't let society stereotype you into acting in a particular way. That is subtle cultural bullying. And there Definitely. is room for cultural right. integration. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Loretta, for your insight on this segment. Well, we're going on a short break now. Plenty more still ahead. Stay with us.